My name is Nina Ekelund and I'm the executive director for the Haga Initiative in Sweden. Last year, we started a four-year project, Climate Neutral Nordics, Klimatneutral Norden. Uh, and Haga Initiative, together with Schift, uh, business climate leaders in Norway, and uh, CLC, Climate Leadership Coalition in Finland, uh, started the project Climate Neutral Nordics. And it's financed by Nordic Council of Ministers. The purpose with Climate Neutral Nordics is to speed up climate transformation uh, in which policy and business <coughs> need to engage and interact with each other. This will lead to a reinforced societal process leading up to a more competitive, inclusive and sustainable Nordic region. We work with mapping business ambition, demonstrating the climate benefits, facilitating interaction between business and policy, and strengthening models, abilities and innovation. In 2021, we made an interview survey with 40 CEOs from one of the biggest, the biggest companies in the Nordics. And uh, the conclusion from that report, from the interviews with the CEOs, was a strong sense of urgency. Nordic business leaders show grave concern on climate change and its consequences. Also, ramp up climate actions. More ambitious policies are required. Carbon pricing is crucial. Nordic companies can play a key role delivering climate solutions worldwide. And last, act, not talk. Targets are clear, but the transitional pace is so slow. Increase cooperation between business and policy and speed up the transition. So this webinar today is one of many work teams in Climate Neutral Nordics. So this webinar, Climate and Security, How to Navigate in a New Geopolitical Context. The word, is, the word is changing fast and the state of crisis seems to be the new normal. We go from a pandemic to a geopolitical conflict in Europe. To help business, policy and all of us to understand the situation and what we need to do, we have brought together expertise from different fields in society. We will discuss what can we learn from previous global crisis, what are the opportunities and challenges for business regarding transformation in the new geopolitical context, how can we strengthen the Nordic collaboration and resilience, and how do we sec secure climate transformation in the value chain. We have a fantastic panel and fantastic speakers. Uh, as you can see, we will start with research and then we move over to business and then to policy. So I'm so glad that you're joining us today. And I also want to say we have a chat uh, that you can use uh, and we will uh, send the questions further to the group that's, uh, that's presenting. So you know you can use the chat and we would love to have your comments. So let's start. Uh, it gives me great pleasure to introduce our first speaker, keynote speaker, Katarina Sikov Magne, that's the director uh, for Green Transition and Energy and System Integration at EU DG Energy. And she will talk about how to navigate in the new geopolitical era with multiple crises. Please, Katarina. Many thanks, uh, Nina, and uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Very pleased to be here today with you, although uh, virtually only. Would, of course, have loved to come to the region, which is also my region. Um, okay, the, I think your event is extremely uh, timely. Uh, I mean, Europe is at the crossroads uh, in the situation whereby Russia has attacked uh, Ukraine, and we are living in a time of enormous challenges and equally important opportunities. Uh, the EU is very conscious of the gravity of the current circumstances and is showing resolve and proactivity. Russia's aggression against Ukraine, which started in February, as we all know, is unacceptable and tragic. The EU has shown a united front has adopted the most advanced sanctions in its history and is strongly supporting Ukraine. 
The first lesson to draw is that our energy system cannot afford to continue to depend on the import of Russian fossil fuels. We are addressing imports of coal and oil in the sanctions regime, uh, but now we need to drastically reduce our dependence on Russian natural gas already this year and end it by 2027 at the latest. This is only five years and not least because Russia already itself has cut supply to five member states, including some of uh, the ones in the Baltic Sea region, showing that it is an unreliable partner. So against this background, uh, the Commission adopted the Repower EU plan, uh, a comprehensive package of proposals prepared by the European uh, Commission across uh, many services, uh, and that was presented in, on the 18th of May. Um, we could summarize the objectives of Repower EU into three. First one, reducing our dependence on Russian fossil fuels. Second, fast forwarding the clean energy transition. And three, achieving a more resilient energy system and a true European energy union. Uh, this enormous challenge requires action at national level as well. Actually, a key component of the Repower EU package is the European Commission's proposal to add a new chapter to the national recovery and resilience plans. We will work hand in hand with national governments, uh, stakeholders, and including, of course, all of you uh, who are present here today to front load investments and address the current challenges. So diversifying import sources and accelerating energy savings are the two key pillars of the strategy. Today, I will focus on the third, accelerating the clean energy transition. So achieving the objectives of the clean energy transition is a major challenge and we must strive to approach it in a cost-effective manner. To this end, we must respect the three objectives of energy system integration. So first, to have a system that is more efficient, circular, and consumes less resources. Second, uh, it is to integrate a large and growing share of renewable energy and to promote electrification. This, of course, means also more volatility in the system. And three, it is to promote the use of renewable gases and fuels where electrification is not possible technically or where it is still too costly. Renewable gases and fuels include, includes in the context both fuels produced from non-biological origin, such as, such as hydrogen, uh, as well as biofuels and other forms of bioenergy. Biofuels will play an important role in decarbonizing the transport sector. That goes without saying. Uh, transport is responsible for a third of final energy consumption and a quarter of total greenhouse gas emissions in the EU. As for the energy system as a whole, we consider that transport should be electrified where possible and be powered by increasing levels of renewable electricity. However, we also know, and all the forecasts show, that biofuels will need to play an important role especially if we think of aviation and maritime, uh, uh, and as these cannot be electrifies, uh, electrified uh, effectively today. So we need to ensure then that the biofuels that we need are truly sustainable. Uh, we believe that so-called conventional biofuels uh, have only a limited role to play in the in the transport sector and their use should be minimized. The message of the Renewable Energy Directive as well as the Commission's provision, uh, proposal for revising uh, the Renewables Directive is very clear in this regard. So while the Directive aims to secure investments that have been made, it, is, it sets clear signals and that the future focus of renewable energy policy in the transport sector will be on promoting other renewable fuels, such as advanced biofuels and synthetic fuels, uh, which 
aim to promote with dedicated measures. Similarly, we need to take action to ensure sustainability of forest biomass. I know the region is very rich in this uh, respect. And the proposal of the revision of the Renewables Directive increases the level of ambition of the protection and sustainability criteria to make most, most efficient use of biomass to maintain the long-term potential of bioenergy and to better protect biodiversity. In view of the urgent need to reduce our dependence on Russian oil imports, we called the co-legislators through the Repower EU plan to further step up the level of ambition of renewable energy across all sectors. Our aim is to reinforce uh, the existing measures uh, in the Renewable Energy Directive and provide the industry with certainty about future market demand for advanced biofuels and other renewable fuels. These are needed indeed to ensure large-scale investment and innovation in the sector. The Nordic countries in particular, but the Baltic Sea region uh, more generally, are among the leaders in the energy transition due to large potential for renewable, including, of course, hydro, but also including biomass. I believe that this leadership will continue and that the energy transition will provide further opportunities for growth and jobs in the Nordic countries. Ladies and gentlemen, I have tried to sketch out the background and the thinking uh, of the Commission when it comes to the energy transition, especially in these difficult times that we are living today. Renewable energy, including biofuels and bioenergy, will be key to this transition and your region is very well placed to take this forward. Many thanks and uh, happy to answer questions there may be. Thank you so much, Katarina. I do have some follow-up questions to you, and we've got some questions on the chat as well. But you mentioned biofuels, and uh, uh, bio bioenergy stands for approximately 60% of the renewable energy sources in EU today and can be used as a, as a source to uh, phase out import dependency. But... Um, uh, in the beginning of May, uh, 517 business leaders from 26 countries sent a letter to the European Commission uh, to include bioenergy solutions in the EU strategy uh, and in that way become independent of Russian fossil fuels. And you mentioned it, uh, but it's still a big worry uh, from the Nordic countries. Will biofuels be more represented in Repower EU? Uh, many thanks, thanks for that important letter and the important question as well. Um, so as, as I outlined briefly in the uh, speech, we consider that biofuels do have an important role to play in uh, sectors where electrification is not feasible, and here especially the heavy transport sector. However, biofuels need to be sustainable. Uh, we cannot afford uh, then losing the benefits that the uh, forests, for instance, bring to decarbonization and also in terms of uh, biodiversity. So that's why we consider that the contribution of biofuels uh, produced from food and feed crops uh, is limited and we should minimize their use. But against this background, the Directive on Renewables uh, introduce limits for conventional biofuels and focuses on the promotion of biofuels produced from waste, residues, uh, uh, like advanced biofuels. So member states are not required to support biofuels produced from food and feed crops, but uh, should focus on the advanced biofuels, uh, which is also the future where innovation is needed and where the potential uh, of the region is enormous. Um, having said this, uh, I would of course then uh, encourage you to continue bringing uh, the concerns you may have to the attention of the Commission and to make your voice heard in, in Brussels. So, But we are certainly very keen to listen and to understand the special concerns you may have. Uh, we have a question regarding this as well. 
from uh, Per Ribbing in the chat. And is it not more wise to use electrofuels rather than biofuels? Um, I think uh, in this uh, situation where we are, on the one hand, uh, you could even say that we have a triple crisis. Uh, on the one hand, there is, of course, war in Ukraine. Then we have the climate crisis, and we also have the biodiversity crisis. And in that context, I think we should use any possibility, any fuel uh, that helps us decarbonize uh, the uh, economy. And in this case, if we speak about transport, help decarbonize transport as rapidly as possible. So here, of course, uh, electrofuels uh, will play an important role, but we also do need biofuels in the mix. So I think what we need to look at, and that depends, of course, also uh, on each country and each uh, specificity of each member state, uh, on what is the best mix in this uh, respect. So, uh, and what is the transition path from today to the decarbonized economy? So every form of uh, fuel that help decarbonize, we should use as much as possible. Please continue to ask questions in the chat. Uh, another questions, question. Uh, large volume of, of combustible waste are deposit within the EU. If the EU's targets for increased circularity is achieved, residuals corresponding to 100 terawatt hours or more remains, which is not proposed to be extracted. Why is the residuals not being energy recovered in EU? And why is not CCS and CCUS technology not used to permanently store 90% of the carbon dioxide and to provide carbon sinks? Uh, thanks. Um, so we do consider that low carbon fuels, as they are called, uh, as opposed to renewable fuels, can play an important role for decarbonization. Uh, especially in the early years of the transition. Um, so while the Renewables Directive will continue to focus on renewable fuels, low carbon fuels and gases are covered by the uh, package we adopted last December that focuses on how to decarbonize the gases sector and how to bring renewable hydrogen and low carbon hydrogen into the market. Uh, so this package is includes definitions uh, as well as fully fledged certification scheme for low carbon fuels and the rules for determining the carbon intensity of low carbon fuels and gases. So this package is still under negotiation uh, in the Council and in the European Parliament and that's perhaps why it is not so topical yet in the, in the industry because it is not yet a uh, law. Uh, When it then comes to carbon capture and uh, storage technologies, uh, we consider these as important decarbonization solutions, uh, especially for the hard to abate sectors like industry or uh, transport perhaps. And uh, the innovation fund uh, that has been there already for quite a while provides, has provided significant funding for innovative pro pro projects, including in the CCS and CCUS uh, sectors. Last year, only 1.1 billion euro was awarded for seven large scales inst installations, uh, four of them including CCS and CCU components. So we certainly do see the potential for these technologies and um, we are increasingly uh, discussing with the sector and also working uh, towards uh, perhaps even a strategy or uh, a legal framework regulatory framework uh, already in addition to the innovation fund already today uh, for the infrastructure, so for the pipes uh, that would transport carbon to a permanent storage is part of the Trans-European Energy Infrastructure Regulation and some projects in the area of uh, uh, the Netherlands uh, in, the, in the North Sea have already received support under this instrument. So CCS and CCUS are certainly uh, emerging technologies and we will need them uh, absolutely. Thanks. 
We have got to some more questions on the chat. Uh, increased carbon pricing uh, is the most powerful initiative. What is EU comments from from Tom? And I know you had a decision in the Parliament, uh, and say and they sent back the uh, parts of the EU ETS last week. So, what is your comment on carbon pricing? Um, carbon pricing. I mean, as an economist like myself, uh, it's obvious that uh, pricing such an externality as uh, carbon is an efficient way forward. We have also seen uh, that the ETS has delivered our electricity sector, has made uh, good progress in decarbonizing. Decarbon now, of course, as we are uh, attacking the harder to abate sector, so member states are in a different situation to, to start with. So that is certainly reflected in the uh, debates that took place in the parliament uh, and also are taking place in the council. Uh, but we need to move fast. We don't have any time to wait. There is urgency. So therefore, uh, we must uh, go forward. I, of course, uh, trust in the wisdom of the political uh, decision making. So we certainly are contributing to that discussion in a positive sense. But having said this, I think what is important that pricing brings, of course, efficiency and the more of the sectors we bring into the ETS, uh, the better. But we need to keep in mind also that a price needs to be paid and some of the more vulnerable households may be in a difficult situation as a consequence. And that's why we also proposed as an accompanying uh, fund that would then uh, address the most vulnerable uh, members of our society so that they can keep up when uh, the uh, carbon price has an impact on be it on transport or uh, buildings. So we continue uh, working on this uh, file and we expect the parliament and the council to uh, resume soon the talks and uh, hopefully having a compromise uh, very rapidly inside. Mm -hmm. And just a last question from Joan. Uh, since we should focus on a broad variety of different solutions available, what incentives may the EU provide the natural and member states to increase accessibility of renewable fuels more than just electrification? Um, on renewable fuels, um, so we have on the one hand uh, proposed uh, uh, targets in the uh, renewables directive, so which is uh, still in the negotiations uh, with the council and, and the parliament. We hope to get into what are called trialogue negotiations uh, in the autumn, so that we could have uh, a conclusion by end of the end of the year. Uh, the targets uh, for biofuels uh, concern transport. We understand that uh, from the many players in the transport sector, uh, they consider these targets to be quite ambitious um, and uh, perhaps they are, but we, we think that it needs to uh, be further developed. Um, the key way to incentivize the uptake of uh, such fuels uh, are of course in the hands of the member states. We set the broad framework in the EU and then member states implement it uh, domestically uh, to ensure that it is best fitting the uh, local uh, and national context. So that's very briefly. Uh, and uh, yeah, thanks. And, and just one, if you can res respond with just two sentences or something, what will be the Nordic contribution to Repower you in yours. What do you think? What will be the most important for, for the Nordics to contribute to with? A um, couple of points. First, uh, Nordics are already very advanced in the decarbonization. So continue telling uh, your success story. How have you have you done it? Second, I think the Nordics um, together now with the Baltics rely strongly on the well-functioning market you have. Uh, you have been precursor in developing the internal market. Continue also there relying on it. 
and passing the messages uh, elsewhere and uh, investment signals. Uh, so these three rapidly. Thank you so much, Katarina Siko Magni. Thank you for joining us this morning. I hope you will have a great day. Thank you so much. My pleasure. Wishing you an excellent discussion and I look forward to hearing Thank all the echoes. Many thanks. Thank you so much. So now we will continue. And I want to introduce my colleague in Norway, Björn K. Haugland, uh, from, that, who is the CEO for Shift Business Climate Leaders, who will moderate the next session with the researchers. Please, Björn. Thank you. And uh, thank you for this uh, nice uh, keynote, kind of setting the frame for the discussion here today. Um, so our uh, panel will basically look into what uh, we can learn from previous global crisis to bring into the crisis we are into uh, just now. And um, that means that we have collected um, four uh, researchers which uh, can enlighten us from, from different uh, perspectives. So the proceedings will be that uh, I will introduce you now for the, for the panel, and uh, I will then give uh, the panel panelists uh, a few minutes just to establish themselves and, uh, and start to reflect on the, on the overall theme of what we can learn from previous global crisis into the crisis we're into to now. And then we will have a follow-up with a panel discussion. And uh, please, uh, I, I encourage you to send uh, questions in the chat if you have anything in particular you would like for us to, to bring up in the, in the panel. So um, then it's a great honor for me to introduce you to um, Louise uh, Simonsson. Uh, she is researcher for Swedish Defense Research Agency. Agency. The next panelist is Kristin Wallevik. Uh, she is the CEO for NORS, which is uh, uh, one of the biggest research institutes here in, uh, in Norway. And then uh, Björn Ola Linnar. He is Professor Environmental Change. Center for Climate Science and Policy Research at Linköping University and Director Mr. Geopolitics. And last but not least, Thomas Korberger, Director, Research Professor, Energy Area of Advanced at Kalmar University in Gothenburg and Executive Board Chair of Renewable Energy Institute in Tokyo. So here we have uh, a lot of uh, knowledge, uh, insight, and uh, just as a starter, I would like to start with you, Louise. Uh, please um, tell us uh, maybe a little bit, you know, about your research and, and, and your initial perspective on what we can learn on the previous crisis, please. I cannot hear you, but maybe it's okay for, for the rest. No. Is it better now? Can you hear yes, me now? Yes, much better. Sorry about that. see you and hear you, please. <laughs> Thank you so much for inviting me. It's a very interesting topic and a, and a very nice initiative. Um, I spend most of my time at the Swedish Armed uh, Forces headquarters as an operational analyst. So my perspective today uh, on this topic is, is mainly coming from the military defense point of view. Uh, and the main concern now is that the um, climate change will worsen both the security risks and at the same time, military conflicts are, are a significant driver of climate change in itself. Also, increased spending on the military often involves large emissions of CO2. 
Um, so that will be my my main point of view in in this panel. Thank you. Thank you, um, Christine. Will you continue from Norway and Bergen? Yes. <laughs> thank you so much, and thank you for the uh, invitation. Um, of course, the climate crisis is a true global uh, crisis, and the question is how to how to deal with uh, that. And it has been known for a long time, but it seems like there is something happened in 2019 where at least a lot of business leaders also really came on board on on, on the the true. Um, risk of the sustainability and the climate uh, issue. And uh, also it seemed like a lot of businesses came to the point that it's more than a pin and nice lights. It really has to be internalized. And also the fact that uh, it's really a survival kit. Being aware and really being uh, vocal on, on sustainability is uh, crucial to, to remain competitive. Um, so now, in general, it seems like there is really a push uh, from behind, at least from, from the kind of a bandwagon effect from, from the business world. Uh, and also the fact that we really need to increase the speed and that also a lot of business leaders now seem to be very impatient to, to get that started. Um, but they now they really experience some limitations. Uh, so there is a push uh, at the same time that it's really hard to to uh, to fulfill some of the, the goals that you really want to do as a business leader. Um, and also the push is really uh, extrapolated from, from the brave, I would say, EU strategy, uh, both the Green Deal, the taxonomy, but also the ESG reporting system will kind of uh, improve or actually push, push the, the development. So it's really not longer a nice to be uh, aware of sustainability. It's really a need to be also to, to survive as, as a business. Um, however, there are huge challenges around us um, and hindrances to ensure, ensure the green shift. And I would just like to mention a few of them, and I, I, I assume we get back to them. Uh, at least in part of the general public, I still believe there is a lack of the uh, sense of urgency, uh, that it really, the, 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 uh, the amount and the, and the, uh, um, the risk of, of sustainability or lack of sustainability and the climate changes. Uh, and also the regulatory framework is really lacking behind uh, in all of the world, but also in, in the Nordic countries. Um, and also I think we need to, the democratic institutions are maybe not set up to, to really handle this beat. And of course, we should definitely remain our democracies and our democratic institutions, but maybe we need to set them up a bit different to, to handle the speed uh, that's needed uh, way going forward. And also how we as democratic countries uh, can deal with uh, uh, many dilemmas that we will experience. And I think that is maybe one of the biggest uh, challenges uh, now is how to handle all these dilemmas. Um, are we prepared to, to make these uh, hard choices? Uh, do we know how to actually do them without uh, experiencing large conflicts? Uh, also the social effect of, uh, of the changes, but also the social accept. Uh, how do we deal with that? Um, how to tackle conflicts? It will be uh, difficult. Also, there will be room for more populistic parties, and that may challenge our democratic uh, systems. Uh, and that may be a difficult because we haven't been there before. And that's maybe we can't experience anything from the previous crisis because that is kind of a new new setup. So, and also the fact that we need more energy at the same time as we need to learn how to reduce energy consumption in areas. So it's really to, to find that balance. And also that we may experience some kind of energy protectionism. And that may also uh, create some uh, disturbance and maybe also instability around us. And all of these elements are, of course, both enlarged and extrapolated by the war in, uh, in Ukraine and also the geopolitical situation. Thank you. Thank you so much for um, lining up these uh, both opportunities, but dilemmas and um, and we will bring them with us in, in the dialogue. Um, then uh, Bjorn, uh, Bjorn Ola, Linnar. Uh, Thank you. Will, will you give us your initial reflections, please? Yes, thanks. Uh, yes, as um, introduced, I'm a director for Mista Geopolitics, which is a 
to our knowledge, the, the largest uh, research program outside the defense industry on ge- how uh, changing your political landscape shapes the conditions for sustainability and vice versa. Uh, so my reflections will be taking its inspiration from the from the work that we've done over six years now. Uh, and I think it is uh, on top of what's said, and this I think ties in nicely to what Christine just said, uh, Russia is not only uh, using natural gas and oil to forward its geopolitical interests, but also weaponizing food. And I think that that is something that we, we need to also keep our eyes on when we talk about the Nordic response uh, the supply chains. What we now see, perhaps, is the emergence of a new bipolar world. We're not there yet, but we can see the contours of that. Uh, the, the, where not where we can say it, something like that. We see uh, one block where we see a transformation towards decarbonization, uh, and one that remains in fossil fuel dependency. We see how both China and Russia has are using. Uh, their, their assets when it comes to natural resources in that way. Uh, and most recently, that we can see it clearly when it comes to food uh, and the weaponizing of food, which is a clear strategy from Kreml. So I think that that is the next crisis that we have to, to keep our eyes on and be prepared for. At the same time, as we address the what was introduced there in, in, in the beginning of the repower Europe. Uh, so we see... In that context, an urgent need for a new green diplomacy, where it's worrisome that we now cut back or at least put on hold uh, climate finance for poorer countries and so on, that, that will reflect badly on the efforts to counter such bipolar world. I think we could safely say that cooperation would be the new realism where, where self-interest is also reflected in that we need cooperation throughout the world and make sure that that the EU is on top of the game there, not really, even though the Green, the green Deal includes Green Deal diplomacy, and I think it, it's some very good ideas put spell out there, but we haven't seen that prioritized just yet. And that is, of course, extremely important in a world where we have seen that the, the less than half of the world's population now live in a democracy of some sort. And, and I think it's only a little more than 6% live in full democracy, and about a third of the world population, more than a third, of the world's population live in authoritarian rules, uh, uh, in states with authoritarian rule. So uh, that said then, if we need to go into uh, green diplomacy where we address the intertwined uh, challenges and opportunities of addressing decarbonization, climate resilience, biodiversity, but also rule-based order, health and and, and human security, uh, there are some Examples from history, at least, that we, we can look at. H- history doesn't repeat itself, but it often rhymes, Mark Twain is famously said. And for instance, we have the Point Four program, all the efforts that that were uh, developed right after the Second World War and the, in the, as the, the Cold War emerged on making sure that, that what was then called the affluence of, of the richer countries should go to, to all countries. Uh, point four what was the program that was initiated by Truman, for instance, to, to, to spread the, 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 the welfare and the democracy of, of the US around the world. Of course, that has been decrit- heavily criticized and used the terms as undeveloped and so on. So, of course, it's not an example of what we should roll out now. On the contrary, there we can learn a lot of the insensitives of not being thinking that the, the Western model is the only model that should be, be uh, determined if a good if life is good or not in societies. But the, the effort to make a concerted effort in addressing uh, environmental issues, even if that uh, name, that concept was not around them, but the natural resources, secure human security when it comes to health, uh, to, to, to food and, and energy, at the same time as that was intertwined into securing democracies around the world. I think that that is something that we need to think about uh, along those lines today. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you very much for for your uh, uh, reflection on on this topic and uh, on and also on the reminder of the green uh, diplomacy, which is uh, both a part of the EU Green Deal and and maybe more important than than ever uh, actually going going forward. Uh, so then. Um, 
Thomas uh, Kobagar, uh, will you give us your, your initial reflections on the topic, please? Yes, I will. I, I'm talking to you from, from Tokyo today, where I've spent the day speaking at other conferences about exactly the same topic. And the, I think, most important observation is that the fossil fuel prices that have resulted from the Russian invasion in the Ukraine and the uh, following conflicts uh, is actually the closest to a global carbon tax that we've ever come to. The, the price effect, the cost effect for increased uh, for, for using fossil fuels is now roughly the same as a global carbon tax would, would, would give. And that calls for accelerated energy efficiency efforts and accelerated deployment of renewable energy in order to keep demand low enough to, to, to make energy available to as many as possible in the world. And this is a common interest for, for the Asian countries and the European Union that are dependent on imported uh, fossil fuels, even if we do our best to, to deploy more renewables and even if we are successful in improving energy efficiency, all of which is now extremely profitable because of these price levels. We will continue to use fossil fuels for several years to come. So as quickly as possible, succeeding with what President Biden is aiming at and what the EU Commission and the German government have clearly sketched that they are uh, intending to achieve is very important for all of us in Europe and for other uh, energy importing countries. So in a way, you could say the conflict in the Ukraine and the geopolitical development is horrible and it may well end up with a global nuclear war and we will have a tough time. Uh, but it may also be an opportunity to actually accelerate all the measures that we would like to see for climate policy reasons. Uh, and uh, we should do our best to avoid a global nuclear war, and we should do our best to deploy this technology as quickly as possible. Thank you. Thank you. So very interesting observation that uh, for 30 years we have discussed this price on carbon and, uh, and, and suddenly the, this conflict in Ukraine and, and Putin has basically implemented that in, in, in a sense, at least the effect of, 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 uh, of, of that. So thank you so much. Um, uh, so uh, I would like to, to focus our discussion on, um, on you, most of you have already touched it, but how will the ongoing climate transformation with this geopolitics we experience now um, how will it change by the by this crisis? What, what what can be accelerated, and what is the negative uh, uh, effects? And uh, so, so that is the initial uh, question. Uh, and then definitely we will re return back to to the Nordic country. So you know, how, so how, how how will this, and and how can this strengthen the Nordic collaboration? But but let's start with, with the climate transformation in in this in this new geopolitical world, um, what is the changes uh, we, we see uh, on, on back of the of the crisis? So uh, I would like to introduce uh, Louise, if, if you would like to, to start, please. Um, thank you. Uh, well, um, speaking then from the military and defense, sector um, and what's going on there is that there has been quite a lot of European initiatives to reduce emissions from the defense sector. Uh, and as I said initially, now when, when that whole sector is growing, there will of course be much more emissions. And to transform the, de the defense sector uh, has many, there are many advantages of, of doing that, but there are also some great challenges. Uh, to reduce the standard emissions, uh, it, it's a much more straightforward um, uh, procedure uh, than to reduce the non-standard emissions. Uh, and by that, I mean to, to reduce, em uh, reduce emissions from defense buildings and day-to-day -day transport and and such things uh, that can be do uh, can be done, uh, and especially then considering what's happening in the civilian sectors. But to decarbonize heavy weapon systems such as fighter jets and uh, tanks and warships and submarines, etc., require 
a considerable amount of, of, of fuel to operate. And, and by fuel, then I mean fossil fuel. Uh, and to transform that is a, is a greater uh, challenge. Uh, however, the high-tech innovations needed to, to um, accomplish such a, a shift to low carbon alternatives could be uh, could jump, jump start the modernization and also be a contributor to the civilian sector and, and the global transformation. Mm. So basically you see that this uh, kind of new world and the, and the crisis might lead to accelerate the, the transformation in, in your sector. Uh, if I look at it from the positive side, yes. <laughs> and if you should comment on the on the negative uh, 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 pathways, well, um, um, the problem, of course, if we look at um, how uh, military operations are being done, there are lots of of new other types of. If you look at the, the weapon systems now that can be used, such as drones, etc. Uh, that are not large emitters, uh, but still uh, that the war is now being uh, in the Ukraine now with the Russian invasion, uh, it's much more of a conventional type of, of war fighting. Um, and uh, we've talked a lot about hybrid wars in, in the last decades or so. Um, and what we see now in the Ukraine is, of course, a hybrid war, but it also has a much, much larger um, conventional uh, type than, than many expected. Uh, and with that comes also very large emissions. Um, mm -hmm. And then, of course, it's if we look at it globally, uh, if the whole world is now uh, increasing their defense sectors and their weapons, um, I fear that the emissions and the transformation might be uh, not the first focus. And that is also what, what many previous crises, both man-made and, and military, as well as natural disasters have shown us that you, we always look at the immediate threats first and try to do as much as we can to avoid them. Or, um, but then, in order to, to create a, a sustainable recovery, we need to think about the more longer term um, uh, efforts that needs to be done also simultaneously. And that is very hard to prioritize in, in such a, a harsh reality that, that we're in now. Thank you. I see Thomas, you have raised your hand. So please, Thomas. I think a very important uh, aspect of this uh, conflict with Russia is that Russia is the country in the world that is a superpower in old energy technology. They are dominating the uh, export of gas and oil. They're large exporters of coal. Uh, together with Kazakhstan and Uzbekistan, they control 50% of the world's ur uh, uranium mining uh, all nuclear reactors construction in the world after 2019 outside China are provided by Rosatom. Uh, they are extremely strong in the old energy technologies, and they are completely without any strategy on renewables. Unlike countries like uh, the Middle East and countries that are now providing the cheapest solar electricity in the world, and, and, and the US and China, and even Norway is doing quite well in, in, in sustainable energy compared to, 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 to Russia. So Russia is extremely vulnerable in relation to the development of, of an energy transition driven by sustainable, renewable energy. And I think that's very important when, when you say now that the, this hybrid war is not uh, so important. I think the hybrid war is now more important than ever. And the Russian interest in, in, in delaying and downplaying the opportunities of low-cost renewable electricity is extremely intensive. And you can just look at what Putin says and then imagine that all his uh, social media uh, actors are, are presenting similar uh, uh, attempts to, to confuse and create conflicts regarding energy policy in the Western world. That is extremely important and more important than ever at this moment. So, so the military uh, warfare is just a part of what's going on in the geopolitical conflicts at the moment. 
Thank you, Thomas. Thank you for pointing out that. And I think your analysis is, um, is uh, very to the point. Uh, you want a, another comment, Louise, please? Yes, just a quick uh, response. I didn't mean to say that the high reward isn't important or, or that's not what's happening. I'm just saying that there is perhaps uh, a larger uh, part of conventional methods, just like, like Thomas said, than that many, um, more than, than what some have had expected. It's of course a great um, part of, uh, of the hybrid dis discussion still, sorry. Thank you. Very good. Uh, we have a question in the chat, but I will bring that forward uh, in, in a minute or so. First, I would like to, to just listen in to, to Kristin and, and Bjorn Ola on, on the same question. And Kristin, you, you said that among your reflections that also it's not everything from previous crisis we can bring into this crisis. And uh, I think you also mentioned democracy 2.0. To, to some extent that we maybe also need to look at the institutions around us. So, mm -hmm. so how do you see this crisis we are into in, 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 in reflection to the energy transition, please? I think in the short term, we will really, the, the countries around us will really focus on being, getting access to energy, uh, both re renewable, but also energy in general. So in the short term, we may experience CO2 emissions increasing uh, because now it's just a matter of actually getting access. In the long term, I think the CO2 emissions will reduce and be maybe faster reduced than otherwise because I think there, there will have to be alternatives. So in, in the, so I, but I think energy protectionism we will experience and, and also with that some instability. Um, but also bringing industry home, meaning that you want to be less dependent on other countries. Uh, also for the renewable part, getting access to solar modules or other things from China is, is difficult right now. So also looking through the supply chains uh, and also really making sure that you get access to, to energy and that you're self-sufficient. Uh, and that may end up with re reversing part of the globalization. And what does that mean in a, in a broader context? If we think about uh, one thing is for, for the Nordic and for Europe, where the standard of living is quite high, uh, in other places, uh, the globalization may end up with, or the reversion may end up with uh, lower uh, export and so on and so forth. So, so it's really, it's, it's difficult to, to really see how can we learn from other uh, crises because they have been more, this is such a, a, a um, it's a vast area. It's really, it's big and it, it's hard to, to, uh, to really decomprise and say what, what actually is. And it's really, it's intertwined in so many ways. So it's really not one crisis, it's so many other elements uh, connected together. So that's why I think we really need to look at a broader sense and also institutions, the way we work, the way we actually uh, trade with others. There's so many other elements that we'll have to uh, mean, look into. Thank you. Uh, any reflection from you, Bjornola, on, on these topics? And then we will go into the chat and look at the questions there. Just very good comments here. So I just let me just add, I think that, that there is, again, something to be learned from, from the post-war, uh, from the early Cold War era, but where we didn't see protectionism in that way, but rather that you saw blocks or regions uh, collaborate in, with increased collaboration, but then uh, decreased collaboration between the, the blocks. And, and that is what I fear. So uh, in the way that the globalization might be, be taking a few steps back, it would be rather be that we don't see See that it's a truly global trade, perhaps, but more in blocks. If, if we're going that way, we can see, as I said, uh, signs of that. We, it remains to be seen. And, and I think EU has a lot to do that, to, to restore the trust in the international system. But that, that requires not only what we deal, how we deal with the war on Ukraine, but how we, we deal with securing resilience and, and transformation in other parts of the countries. EU's collaboration with uh, South Africa now on decarbonizing the, the coal industry and so on would be an important example. We'll see what comes out of that. Thank you. 
Let me just very quickly also say another thing that, that we can see, though, is that historically, if we still are still having our eyes on what we can learn from history, is that we can see that disruptive events throughout history has uh, sometimes led to societal transformation of the scale that, that we envision where, with the Green Deal, that it's not only a transformation towards decarbonization, but sustainability at large, where uh, with, with health, biodiversity, well-being, uh, human security, and so on. And often it comes with the perspective changes that it starts with. I'm a lead author in the chapter from the International Science Policy Platform on Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services, precisely on how transformative change. We have three years in that work, so, so it's early days yet. But percep perception shifts are important. We often focus on the technology changes in transformation, but that often is something that can drive transformation. And then the structural dis dislocation that comes when ordinary routines of social life are put into doubt or, or new power relations exist and, uh, come, to, come to play and so on. New, then new possibilities that previously were unthinkable are suddenly thinkable and prioritized. And I think that will be the most uh, eminent effect that we've seen or immediate effect that we've seen from the COVID-19 crisis, but perhaps also with the current crisis. Uh, so if we want to be hopeful, we can see some, some traits of that in the current discussion, in the public discussion. Thank you. So the time is running very fast for us here. Um, Luis, do you, is, this a, is that a new hand or an old hand? Sorry, old hand. An old hand, very good. So then I, I will give the last question to Thomas because uh, can you read the questions in the chat, Thomas? Yeah, there are a couple of questions on nuclear, both uh, regarding the SMR efforts in some countries, Britain among them, and the uh, thorium reactor possibilities. And I, I think that technically uh, you can do both small modular reactors and you can make uh, thorium reactors, but the question is, Will they ever be able to economically compete with the low-cost renewables now available? And I think the nuclear industry has a lot to prove, uh, not only in theory, but even more so in practice. Regarding small nuclear reactors, small reactors have traditionally been more expensive than big. It's difficult to believe that they will be able to compete, and especially, and that's my at this moment in history, that's the most important thing it will not be fast. It will not be fast enough to meet the needs of the current fossil fuel price crisis. And it will not even be fast enough to meet the needs of, of the climate crisis. But I think it's welcome that uh, efforts are made to, to test these technologies. 200 million British pounds for SMR is uh, a lot of money, but in the nuclear industry, it's still very small compared to the cost of one large reactor. Uh, so uh, do try, but don't waste too much money trying, but may waste some, uh, spend some money trying. Thank you. Uh, Bjorn Ola, it's also one question particular to you. Uh, if you would like to just give a 30 second comments on that. Sure, thanks. I was just responding by, by text. But yeah, so increased purchasing power is uh, for now the most important uh, form to, in, to secure, uh, to increase food security in the world. We have enough food as it is now, but it, in the coming decades, it will be more problematic with climate change. But so increasing the purchasing power in vulnerable countries and the poorer countries that are now at risk uh, with uh, for a food crisis is the most immediate action. Thank you. So then I would just thank all of you for giving your very quick and, and short and to the point uh, reflections on this topic. Uh, I think on a, on a broader um, uh, context, uh, Haga Initiative, uh, the Climate Leadership Coalition in Finland and Shift in Norway as individual organizations are all working uh, very closely with academia and, and researchers. And I think in this systemic transitions we are into, it is so important that business and researchers are working very close together. And uh, so I will just encourage everyone to work closely together because uh, that is the way we can do this transformation with knowledge 
with insights and, and learn from the past as much as, as possible. So I encourage you all to continue that collaboration. And with those words, I would just again thank you all of you. It will be possible to approach each of the panelists here with the comments and questions if you have uh, in, in the chat, and we will make sure that these uh, questions are, are responded to. So with that, thank you so much. And back to you, Nina. Thank you so much, Björn Haugland. And you can stay for a second, Björn, uh, before you disappear. What is your sentence about this uh, uh, panel? How would you summarize it in one sentence? Well, I, I, I would summarizes that the, the crisis we are into definitely can be a very uh, catalyst to accelerate the transformation. And I think that is the overarching perspective. Mm. But we should also be aware that it might have some you know, negative sides with it. But I think the overarching mm. perspective mm. is that the uh, a conflict in, in Ukraine really can mm. accelerate the transition yes. to a safe and sustainable future. Thank, Thank you. you so much, uh, Bianca Haugland, CEO Shift. Thank you. So let's move on, and I would like to present uh, Vela Pekka Tink. Tynkinen. He's the professor in Russian environmental studies from the University of Helsinki. And we asked him also for, for a perspective on, uh, on the crisis. So please. Good morning. And you are a professor in Russian environmental studies at the University of Helsinki. And you also lived in Russia for a long time. Yes, I did during the 70s, actually, during, in, in, in the Soviet Union and, and in, lived in Moscow and went to the Soviet kindergarten. So uh, uh, know quite much about Russian culture and society. Fantastic. So uh, looking at the situation today, natural resources and politics, how is it connected in Russia today? It is very much connected. Uh, if you look at the, um, Russia's economy during the last 20 years, the importance and role of oil and gas, fossil energy has increased a lot. And actually, uh, I see that uh, the, the fact that fossil energy and the economies, but also networks of power related to oil and gas actually are part of the problem that we see today in Ukraine. So ability to centralize power uh, via the materialities and economies of oil and gas has made it more easy for Putin regime first to centralize power in Russia and, and increase violence within the borders of Russia and later on, as we've seen already a decade, outside Russian borders. And this is, I don't explain that oil and gas is the reason why there is a war in Ukraine, but I argue that actually it is more easy because of the uh, economies and, and basically geographies of, of oil and gas to uh, uh, have this vi violence uh, that we see today in Ukraine. How can we in the Nordics understand this situation right now? Well, I think uh, what it is at stake in, in Ukraine uh, and in, in ger general I mean, geopolitical situation facing the globe at the moment, uh, we also have to remember that it's um, uh, it's it's not only a war about Ukraine's independence, but it's it's a wider uh, confrontation and conflict between authoritarian Russia and authoritarian world, basically, vis-a-vis -vis, uh, democratic and 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 free free world, basically. So the, the the war has to be understood in this way. And of course, the Nordic countries have a long tradition uh, in civil society, strong democracy, welfare society. These issues um, we need to uh, communicate towards Europe that this, these are the things that we, we value. These are the issues that are important for Europe as a whole. And that way, uh, try to build a common European uh, understanding that what, at, what is at stake in Ukraine is actually uh, uh, has to do very much with uh, our future as a, as a democratic and, 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 and free, actually, space. So, so uh, this will delay the green transformation in Europe due to the war in Ukraine, would you say that? 
Well, of course, we don't know yet how it will evolve, but if we have more and more of this kind of fear within Europe that uh, we cannot make uh, ambitious climate policy uh, decisions because of fear of inflation, that will postpone energy transition. And this is exactly what Putin's Russia wants to do. They want to give an extra time for fossil energy. This is also their objective, and this has to be understood and communicated to European citizens and politicians. And the longer we postpone <laughs> these important decisions, the, the longer we will be dependent on, on Putin's gas, for example. So in that sense, it's, it's highly important. But as I said, I, important is also to buffer against the negative impacts of inflation in Russia, in, in Europe, in a, in a sense that, uh, that the uh, least of people the, the poorest people in Europe are not the ones who will be paying proportionally too much for this for this inflation that we will anyway have. So it's about taxation, about about uh, subsidies to to vulnerable groups and so forth. And I think this is highly important in that sense that if you look at what has been Putin's Russia's objective is to is to conquer and divide to to build. Uh, alliances in Europe, especially with the far right and populist parties, to break the European uh, unified Europe. Mm -hmm. And in this situation, if we let the prices and inflation to impact the least of people, we will see more and more populist parties, more and more populist uh, kind of sentiment in Europe, which will uh, be a uh, kind of a very negative and will have a negative effect on, on European unity. So in that sense, I mean this tax, ta taxation policy, but also this communication vis-a-vis -vis European citizens that what it is at stake here is highly yeah. important. If you could just give my last question, one recommendation to Ursula von der Leyen uh, in this situation right now, what is that? Uh, try to get rid of uh, Russian fossil energy as, as soon as possible, uh, build uh, uh, resilient system to uh, kind of protect the least of people in Europe for not to uh, kind of put uh, fuel to the flames to the populist sentiment in Europe that will will kind of devastate Europe. So that's highly important. Thank you so much, Vili Pekka for for this interview. Thank you so much. Thank you. Kinan, uh, professor in Russian Environmental Studies from the University of Helsinki. So now we will move on and talk about the value chain, what to know to handle the risks. And I hand over to my colleague, Malin Redma, who's been the project leader for a report of reduced emissions in the value chain. Please, Malin. Uh, thank you, Nina. Uh, so in April uh, 2021, uh, the Hagen Initiative came out with the report perspectives on the value chain, what to know to handle the risks, and minskade utsläpp i värdekedjan in Swedish. Um, for uh, this report, we interviewed 21 companies to give uh, their sp perspectives on the value chain and what to know to handle the risks, and uh, more precise, the demands on suppliers, uh, how to increase transparency in data, uh, increase collaborations and opportunities with collaboration, uh, new strategies, uh, and business models, and the need for policy, uh, such as climate impact and the geopolitical situation and how that impacts the value chain. Um, we had a question regarding the geopolitical situation and how that impact the companies and the value chain, in which the companies responded with uh, that the situation can affect su the supply chains by creating uh, financial difficulties uh, and risks for bo both suppliers as well as for business agreements. Uh, the current situation can create a boost for env environmental friendly investments. Um, and uh, further on, we uh, questioned the companies regarding collaboration in the value chain, which all the companies uh, saw as the key um, for working with the value chain. Um, in which uh, the companies answer that collaboration can lead to new partnerships uh, with new business ideas, uh, as well as affect investors' interest and uh, provide the conditions for further anchoring sustainability issues. Uh, all the companies uh, talked about how transparency increases, um, or how transparency is important for um, increasing more da data sharing uh, and to uh, spark new collaborations and industry networks. Um, 
cooperation is a prerequisite for creating more circular flows and it's important to work with the value chain. Uh, we had an important quote from uh, the report from Jens Bruno, which is a climate expert uh, in climate and sustainability from the company Prem, which is a fuel company, uh, in which she describes that contributing to the society's climate goals, uh, their operation needs to change across the entire value chain. He continues with mentioning how an uh, active internal monitoring provides Prem with input to their strategy and helps them, them to create the momentum uh, to actively change in step with society, which goes with a fast pace. Prem has recognized, uh, reorganized and are now working on the bigger journey uh, of change in the company's history with investments in multi-billion class. Um, lastly, uh, the company talked about how to, to um, reduce the climate impact in the value chain uh, they want the policy to deliver more stable and long-term political decisions. Uh, the political decisions that favor green transition uh, should be more into the transport sector. Um, the companies need more instruments that promote circulari cir circularity and also more harmonized reporting methods. Um, thank you. Thank you so much, Malin. And this was really a good introduction for our next speaker uh, that is uh, going to continue to talk about the value chain. That is Jakob Reme, professor in, in industrial economics and management at Linköping University here in Sweden. Welcome, Jakob. Thank you very much. And you've been listening uh, all the time? Yes, I have. On the perspective. Pardon? Very interesting. It has been, yes. So, looking at the value chain, how, we, how is it and will be affected by this geopolitical crisis? Absolutely. And I think that the, the, the panel, we're, we're talking about this already. And I, th I think that what we have seen is that, um, because before 2016, I, I think that we all, all saw that we had like a seamless type of supply chain or value chains in the world and that no one was seeing this as any, any of, of a concern at all. Whereas, you know, we've had this, it's not only the U Ukrainian, you know, the Russian attack on the Ukraine, but it's also a political movement with the, you know, the Brexit uh, election, the Trump uh, and with China, where we've gone from outsourcing to near sourcing. We've had the pandemic, which had a huge impact on our supply chains with closed borders, production breakdowns, a, a, a very big unbalance in, in freight containers, etc. And what we see is basically three strong influencing factors for the for the development of, of global value chains. And one is something that you also took up here, and that is technology with uh, IT and blockchain, uh, track and trace systems, making supply chains much more efficient by by and also at the same time in terms of sustainability to achieve much more transparency. But there are also uh, big problems with that, you know, in terms of potential surveillance problems as well. Another uh, very important aspect that has had a huge in influencing factors on, on factor of, of, uh, of global value chains is uh, policies and, and political efforts. And this is, you know, with a renewed interest in this right now as well, you know, one thing is, it's also that we've had, uh, you know, the, the policies and the political uh, will to protect national markets. But it's also in, in terms of that um, uh, sustainability efforts and trade tariffs that will have an impact on this as well. And now we also see uh, more security concerns. Uh, and that is also something that will will alter the landscape in terms of how we look at different markets. Finally, business strategies. <clears throat> you can say that just a few years back, we could see a few companies looking at supply chain risk. But now I would say that almost all companies are investigating their supply chains, their value chains, and reconsidering old outsourcing, taking back production. And uh, this is a huge uh, shift in terms of how companies are viewing this as well. Uh, so absolutely, the geopolitical crisis have had a huge impact on 
uh, our value chains. Is, is it anything in the value chain perspective that might slow down the speed of the climate transformation? I, I definitely think so, and I think that uh, we've been talking about the Russian crisis and or the you know the the war in the Ukraine, and uh, this is something that will have a, a huge impact on this. But the, it's also a matter of this this uh, complete development when we when we're looking at this and taking back production, and we are potentially also then leaving some developing countries, you know, and um, then there will be less possibilities to influence. Uh, companies and also countries uh, in terms of this. And if, if you're looking at people as well, uh, if they have problem in, in sustaining themselves to buy food, etc., uh, we could also see that issues such as, you know, CO2 or biodiversity will not be as focused. No. So uh, how is the geopolitical uh, crisis affecting the prices both for companies and for consumers? Well, I, I think that um, um, this is, I mean, like this has, has had a huge impact already. The break, this breakdown, I would like to call it, in global value chains, in, in production, in freight, the lack of components, delays in supply. Uh, this has had a huge impact already, and it, this is and, and the energy prices, of course. I mean, like raw materials is going up in price, and this has resulted in 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 uh, already in rapid inflation across the world. And uh, we can also see that a number of companies are are raising prices just because they can, and also because they've got problems in in supplying uh, products. Uh, but I think that the the Russian situation now is is uh, is um, is is a big impact on this, and uh, um, and particularly in terms of uh, food prices. And this will, I mean, like when we see this autumn, I think that we will have even more higher prices. Yeah, thank you so much, Jakob Rema, Professor Industri Industrial Economics Management at Linköping University. Thank you so much. And now we will move on to a panel uh, with. Uh, the companies and business and business organizations. And uh, we will talk about what are the opportunities and challenges for business regarding climate transformation in the new geopolitical context. And I'm really glad to, uh, to introduce uh, the panel. And we can see Ulva Vesen, CEO at Folksam. Hi, Ulva. And then we have also Anders Egelrud, who's the CEO of Stockholm XG. Uh, hi, Anders. And then we also have uh, Anders Gaudestad, Executive Vice President, Energy Management and Trading, Agde Energy in Norway. Hi, Anders. Hi. And then we have Anna Karin Hatt, who's the CEO and President for the Feder Federation of Swedish Farmers, LRF, from Sweden. Hi, Anna Karin. Good morning. And, and we are waiting for Jan Moström, uh, CEO, LKAB, and also for Åsa Pettersson, who comes... Oh, hi, Åsa. You Hello. <laughs> Good morning. <laughs> I, was, <laughs> I didn't see you, so I'm glad to see you, Åsa. You're the CEO for Sweden Energy, energiföretagen i Sverige. Yes. Yes. Well, good morning. Good, good morning, Åsa. And then we are just waiting for Jan Moström, CEO at LKAB. Oh, here we got John Moström, uh, CEO, LKAB. Good morning, John. Can you hear me? I think you froze. Uh, <laughs> no, you can hear me. I, yes, I can hear you. I have some problem with my with my uh, connection here. So. Hopefully, I will be here now for, for a moment. Yeah. Perfect. And we, we will have a discussion here. And we have food and agriculture on the theme. We have energy. And we also have the perspective for, from the finance sector. And uh, I have asked you all to start out with the question, what are the opportunities and challenges in your sector for business regarding uh, climate transformation in the new geopolitical context. And I want to start with Anders Egelrud from uh, Stockholm XG. Hi, Nina, and thanks for that. And thanks for interesting uh, seminar so far. Uh, 
I start shortly. Uh, Stockholm XG, a locally based energy company, uh, we're supplying more than 800,000 Stockholmers with uh, district heating, district cooling, and electricity capacity also, and waste handling. And I think all this uh, makes up very, very interesting in the geopolitical context we are now. We are already based on 99% of renewable or recovered energy. Uh, and our next phase actually is to establish then a carbon sink without using more resources, without using more or less anything else, instead producing more energy from a process of also capturing carbon and in amount which are uh, as, as high as all the traffic emits in Stockholm during one year from one chimney and biogenic carbon. Uh, the new geopolitical situation, uh, it's emphasized the need of really get rid of dependency of fossil energy. I think it has mentioned already during this seminar, fossil energy is definitely something which creates enormous stress and conflicts in the world, has done historically and will make it also going forward if we not can find solutions based on new rules, based on sustainable value change. If I then look on the opportunities from a Nordic perspective, I can see that we have tremendous opportunities in the Nordic countries. We have already uh, an energy sector which actually are twofold. We have the district heating infrastructure, we have the uh, electricity infrastructure, we can develop both, but they need to be developed uh, in, in combination. We need to have a holistic view on the energy sector. Taking one example, the district heating sector today provides the electricity sector with 10 gigawatt electricity capacity during winter season. That's actually one third of the total amount of capacity in Sweden today. We don't talk about that. We need to remain that. It's as much as 10 nuclear reactors annually. Uh, we also need to make sure that we have local <coughs> supply of electricity capacity, security of supply. We can make that by having our district heating system, combined heat and power locally in the municipalities where we need electricity capacity. And we can also, with that capacity, also handle the volatility on the energy market much better than without it. Carbon sinks will be necessary. And if I look at an opportunity for the Nordic countries, only in Sweden, we can create 13 million tons of carbon sinks without utilizing more resources. And that would be a green industry. It would make it possible to store it permanently in technical carbon sinks or storage. And it will be possible also in the future to utilize it for producing synthetic fuel with hydrogen and producing other products. Then we really create a value chain, which are, are actually a green transition. But the challenges, and the challenges are, are many. Yes, I think yes, that, short uh, Anders. Katarina in the beginning mentioned some, and I think that the framework for doing this is not established. The Repower Europe is actually threatening the Nordic countries regarding biomass and it's threatening it because taking waste into consideration. We are throwing 100 terawatt hours on landfill in Europe instead of utilizing the energy and importing Russian gas mm -hmm. and oil instead. So there are many challenges and I will come back to them later. But Thank yes, thank you so much, Anders, and we will come back to, to these challenges uh, again. And I would like to hear Anders Gaudestad uh, from Agder Energy in Norway, who's the Executive Vice President of Energy Management and Trading. You're also in the energy sector. So what is your pers perspective of opportunities and challenges? I think it's both a challenge and an opportunity. Uh, and to be a part of that in these times is uh, really exciting as well as, as of course, difficult. But Agda Energy is has a clear uh, job to provide uh, clean energy for a sustainable society now and in the future. And that is really meaningful, especially in this uh, geopolitical context we are in right now. And we are a vertically integrated uh, renewable group, meaning that we have all parts of the value chain from production, distribution, energy management, and, and sales of renewable energy to the end customers. And I think that is that is a, a very good position to have right now because the demand for that will just you know, increase uh, immensely in the future. 
And it leaves us with great opportunity to actually increase the business at the same time as we contribute to achieving you know, key priorities for society. Uh, and given the, the brutal Russian invasion of Ukraine, this has been more evident than ever that renewable energy is a, a good solution for the short and the, especially the long term. Um, and I think also, you know, Agder Energy being located where we are in the southern part of Norway with direct access to central Western Europe countries gives a lot of opportunities across those borders. And we also produce now hydropower in the southern part of Norway in a price area with um, being the, the influence of the European power prices right now, we have record high financial results and an opportunity to significantly increase our future investments into more renewable energy solutions. Also in new areas like offshore wind, battery, hydrogen, um, and, and, and more. So I think there's a lot of opportunities and a lot of challenges. And, and to, to simplify you know, the, the challenges, I normally talk about the energy trilemma, which is not in balance right now. You have the affordability of energy, uh, you have the uh, sustainable energy, and you have security of supply. And what we have seen lately is, of course, a dramatic shift towards security of supply, and maybe even you know, security of the nations. That results in high unbalancing in this trilemma, extreme prices, high volatility, market uncertainty, and a risk of political interference in the market. And there is no easy solution to the challenge in the short term. In the long term, it's easier. And to see that shift in decision making, the, the speed that is needed, I think it's it's a lot a lot a huge challenge, but also a lot of opportunities. <laughs> Thank you so much, Anders. So, so let's move on to Åsa Pettersson, who's the CEO for Sweden Energy, energiföretagen that collects all the energy companies here in Sweden. Uh, your perspective of opportunities and challenges. Thank you very much, Nina. And my colleague has, uh, from the energy sector have already pointed to many of those uh, opportunities and challenges. But let me just underline that energy is, of course, at the forefront of the climate transformation from the very start. The climate challenge is caused by the burning of fossil fuels and will not be solved until we reduce the burning of these fuels. And Russia's invasion of Ukraine adds a completely new context to this, uh, which of course is both a challenge and an opportunity at the same time. As uh, Anders was into here, security of supply and diversity of energy supplies are now strong reasons to reduce the dependence of Russian fossil fuels. Also, like we heard from uh, <coughs> DG Energy and uh, Katalina in the in the start of today's meeting. Uh, but as we know, the war in, in Ukraine has driven up prices on the energy market sharply and also added a lot of turmoil and volatility. So it's in this context that we now have to uh, uh, really use this as an opportunity to speed up this trans transition because higher prices might at the same time be a driving force to diversify and invest in fossil-free energy and accelerate the build-out of renewable uh, energy, as we've heard. And we all know electrification is a large part of the answer also to the transition of, of the industry and the transport sector. And here my member companies uh, and the energy sector is at the center of making this possible. But then we need a lot of focus on the, of this and speed and a lot of support from policy, uh, which I guess we will come back to in a while. Yes, thank you. Thank, thank you so much, Åsa. Uh, so let's move out from the energy sector to the food and agriculture sector. And uh, let's start with Anna-Karin Hatt, uh, CEO of uh, LRF in, in Sweden, uh, Federation of Swedish Farmers. And, and looking at your sector, we could hear earlier from the researchers talking about there will be a huge even worse crisis, we are facing a food crisis in the world. And right now we know how important Ukraine are for the food and we know how important Russia are for, for fertilizers. So, so in your perspective, what are the opportunities and challenges for the agriculture, Anna-Karin? 
Well, uh, I'm representing the Federation of Swedish Farmers, LRF, and, and we um, represent approximately 136,000 individual members. They run some 70,000 uh, companies, uh, mostly within agriculture or forestry. And they are really highly committed to making food systems more sustainable uh, while prov providing healthy food for our own needs in Sweden, uh, but also elsewhere. I would say that there are great uh, possibilities and great challenges at the same time also for food production. Uh, to be begin with, uh, farmers and forest owners are, to begin with, uh, at their core, working in a way where they are a solution on many issues related to climate change. Uh, we all know that growing crops on the fields is not only a way of produ producing food. It is a way of binding carbon into the ground. Breeding cows or pigs is not only a way of producing meat in a very sustainable way in our country. It's also a way uh, of uh, producing valuable manure, creating biodiversity in our country in fields that cannot be used for anything else uh, than breeding cattle. The big challenge to biodiversity in Sweden is not that we have too much livestock in our country. It is that it has been decreasing over many, many uh, years. Uh, so we have to, to make that uh, shift. Uh, and looking into forestry, I mean, taking care of the forests and using it in a wise way to provide society with renewable energy, renewable building materials, even clothing uh, made out of materials from wood is, of course, a very good way of replacing harmful fossil fuels and binding carbon at the same time as the forests, forests are growing. So to begin with, I think that far farmers and forest owners really have uh, a lot of good news to tell, uh, but we still have more to do uh, and challenges to face. Uh, when it comes to contribution, I think that we are doing a lot, but we can do more when it comes to using the possibilities of storing carbon uh, in agricultural fields. We can do more in producing bioenergy to replace fossil fuels in the farmer's own production, in our own country, in our own region, but also for markets abroad. Uh, this new geopolitical context has really underlined that we are very vulnerable when it comes to food production uh, in Sweden and in the Nordics. And that's due to our heavy dependency on import of almost everything that we need to produce food uh, on a farm level. That's fertilizers, it's fuels, it's seed, it's fodder, uh, and many more. Uh, and lots of it uh, by direct imports from Russia and, and uh, other things uh, produced with fossil fuels from Russia, even though it might be produced in, in Europe. So as a country, uh, and I'm, now I'm talking for Sweden, uh, we really need to increase our own production of uh, food uh, and we need to increase our own production of uh, the imports uh, the inputs that we need to produce uh, food. Um, today, we are only producing around 50% of what we are consuming when it comes to food in our own country uh, today. Uh, that's way too little, and we have great possibilities for many reasons to produce more food uh, in our own country for our own needs, but also for other need needs. So I would say that all this was very obvious for us, long before uh, Russia uh, began the horrible crime, uh, crimes and war uh, in Ukraine. But it has been become even more apparent through that and, and after that. And now we really need to make this happen. Uh, start producing inputs, increase mm. uh, production, both uh, of agriculture and of renewables from, uh, from both agriculture and from, uh, from the woods in Sweden. Thank, thank you so much, Anna-Karin. Uh, and we started out with energy here and uh, moved over to agriculture, but it's still energy. And we will move over to LKAB and to Jan Moström, who's the CEO for LKAB. And there is a connection between agriculture and also LKAB with the fertilizers and, uh, and the need for that. So please, Jan, what's your perspective on possibilities and, and challenges? Thank you. We'll also, of course, connect to energy. Of course. I, I, I would say LKB, we are a 
company that was founded back in 1890, and we have mainly been an iron ore producer. <clears throat> but also we have a large footprint as industrial minerals uh, supplier. And we are also now working with uh, develop a mineral called appetite in our operations to, to a product. But if you go to the opportunities for LKB or the mining industry in the context of regarding climate change and um, the new your political content, I would say it's uh, mining or metal and minerals that will be one of the most important uh, solutions to, to offset the energy problem. If we are going to replace oil, gas and coal, because that is, as we heard previous, the core of, of uh, the climate transformation, we need to replace that with wind, with solar or nuclear power in some content of, of hydropower. But all those uh, production systems will need a lot of minerals and metals. And those mineral metals will generally be producing electricity. And with electricity, we will also produce uh, hydrogen. The other parts which we use a lot of, of, um, of uh, especially coal, but also natural gases, is to reduce oxides. In other parts, we are reducing iron ore, sorry, <coughs> iron ore with coal in blast furnaces. And that produces a lot of volumes of, of carbon dioxide. That is our intention is to replace that with, <coughs> sorry, I got something in my throat, is to replace that coal with the hydrogen. And by doing that, we will remove for just our small part of, of uh, ore production, 30 million tons, roughly 40 to 50 million tons annually of carbon dioxide. But also if we go into other materials, for example, uh, appetite or uh, ammoniac, that is one important part in fertilizers, mineral fertilizers. We are today using uh, natural gases to reduce uh, ammoniac. And uh, by replacing that with uh, hydrogen, we will have a huge impact on, on um, the climate change, but we will also start to produce a green uh, mineral fertilizers. So if we see the mining industry and the mining industry's impact, both in climate change and also in the new geopolitical content, we will have a core positions. First, to, to ensure that we will have the materials, metals and minerals that will ensure that we will be able to produce the energy that is necessary both for electricity, but also to produce hydrogen and use hydrogen as a reagent for oxides to create the materials that will be so important. And of course, the challenge will be how to ensure that the materials that we will use going forward are green materials. That means that the materials has to be, we must have some sort of traceability on these materials. How do we compare the steel production of green steel with steel produced with blast furnaces? How can we ensure that the mineral fertilizers we are using are green mineral fertilizers and not by using natural gases, etc.? So I would say the metal and min mineral industry will be the core to offset those the climate change, but also to ensure the value chain, how to ensure that the material, the raw material we are using are, so to say, fair trade material. And especially in the context with Russian Ukraine, Ukrainian crisis, with Russian as the main suppliers of raw materials. So, <laughs> thank you so much, John Mostram, CEO LKAB. And and all this need finance, and uh, that brings us over to Ulva VC and see what Folksam. Uh, and you have a quite different role in this uh, panel: uh, financing and also uh, uh, working with insurance. Also, so, so what is your perspective from from your role of opportunities and challenges, Ulva? 
Well, thank you, Nina. Thank you so much for arranging this interesting seminar. And thank you for giving me the opportunity to participate from a dif different perspective. And uh, as you mentioned, I'm here today representing Folksam, which is one of the largest insurance and pensions companies in Sweden. And uh, we insure almost every other Swede. And we are also one of lar Sweden's largest investor. Um, the topic of today is climate and security and how to navigate in a ge new geopolitical context. And the war is, of course, a primary challenge, not only for Ukraine, but for the whole Europe and the world. And But crisis causes problems, but they can also offer an adjustment window. We have touched base on that previously today. And many of us has realized that Europe's dependence on Russian oil and gas is unsustainable in many perspectives. And we therefore need to rethink about our energy supply in a Nordic perspective. Um, despite the concerns um, in the outside world, we need to stay focused on the climate work. And the climate issue remains acute. And we, as a societal level, cannot afford to lose momentum. And as an investor, we are continuing to work according to our plan uh, to have net zero emissions at, in our investments portfolio to 2050, but also in our own operations, in our insurance operations to 2030. And there will be, I think, opportunity opportunities here for us, both as an insurance company, as an investor, to be part of a faster transition to a fossil-free world. And there will be investment opportunities where I hope Folksam can play an important role because we have this net zero target to 2050. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ylva. And, uh, the, 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 all the panelists, you could say, that we had during the whole day have been talking about what we need from policy. And also mentioned it clearly as well. There is, there's so much we need to, to do to get from the policy to get this to work. And uh, I would like to ask you, if you start with the energy sector, what, do you, what, do you, what do we need right now to, to, uh, to speed up? the climate transformation, as you all mentioned, that, that you contribute to. So what is the most urgent, what you need from, from, from both EU and on a national level? And I'll start with Osa. Now we Thank can you hear you. Much, <laughs> yes, now you can hear me. Thank you very much, Nina. Yeah, there is uh, for sure a lot to do. And I mentioned the, the need of speed. So uh, on the large scale, we need uh, <laughs> huge investments in both new energy production and new power grids. I mean, only in Sweden, we're facing a doubling uh, of electricity demand uh, until 2045, which means we need to build out uh, one more electricity system or energy system like the one we have today. Uh, of course, here, both electricity and heat, like Anders Egelrud was mentioning earlier, uh, are very important because this needs to be seen from a holistic perspective and keep an integrated approach. Uh, and what we urgently need from policymakers is long-term conditions that promote these investments and a reduction of lead times and the bureaucracy to build it. This is, of course, more long term and we're facing a crisis here and now uh, on both how to face out fossil fuels and the higher prices. As we heard from the Commission this morning, I mean, this cannot be fixed during this year or next year, uh, but uh, we need to start doing things uh, already now. And in the short term, we need clarity on the ro role of biofuels. Uh, where my members uh, feel a lot of insecurity right now. What is the, the future of use of biofuels? I mean, within the Fit for 55 packages, we get very mixed signals. I was very happy to hear uh, from DG Energy this morning. It, uh, she stressed several times the role of bioenergy uh, in both uh, electricity and energy sector and in general in Europe. So that, that, that uh, felt very good, but that's not what we see in the legislation right now. So this we need to keep an eye on together. 
And uh, we also need competitive conditions for the heat and power sector. Uh, Anders mentioned the, the potential of the heat that we have already in the system, but we also actually have 500 to 1000 megawatt, megawatts unutilized capacity of combined heat and power uh, electricity is that is which could be added to the electricity production of Sweden if for example the tax on bio oil was taken away <laughs> immediately <laughs> and uh, from a political perspective that is not the large risk it's not uh, uh, it's just uh, uh, complicated from a bur bureaucratic perspective but this is just something that the politicians could do that would ease up and uh, um, improve the situation all, already for the coming winter in Sweden. And also uh, the possibility to counter trade uh, this capacity between, in, between the Swedish price areas uh, could be used much more systematically and there could be, be uh, incentives in place from the Swedish transmission system op operator to, to, uh, to stimulate this. Uh, so that is all, all on the short term what we need. And uh, also what we don't need <laughs> are short-sighted interventions in the market. We need to, even if we are in a hurry, uh, we need to look at this uh, from a long-term perspective and uh, in close dialogue with all stakeholders, uh, industry, energy sector and policy, uh, speed this up together. Well, Thank so you, I'll stop there. I'm sure yes. there's more to say. There's so much to say, and I just want to follow up with a question, because we heard Thomas Korberger, Professor at Chalmers, saying that the fossil prices we now see, it's like having a global tax on carbon that we really longed for for a long, long time. At the same time, we say, you say you see the high prices. So, what should it be, high prices or not? Yeah, but I think this is during, right now we have the high prices, but that's also <laughs> why this could be, be described as this tax. Uh, actually, fossil fuels are more expensive than renewables <laughs> uh, or other types of, of fossil free energy. So, I mean, it's because of the fossil fuels that we see the higher prices. So in this period of transition, uh, we, we, we need to cope with the high prices, but at the same, mm. same time, then accelerate the measures to move away from the fossil fuels. But and that's why it worked, uh, works, like Professor Colbert was saying. We have this tax not right now that yes. really gives us the incentives to move away from the fossil yeah. fuels. Thank, thank you so much, Rosa. That's uh, a good explanation that we really needed to hear right now. Was, and also, I want to move over to Anders. When, when Rosa mentioned uh, uh, DG Energy and the role of ben and uh, Bioenergy, Anders also was uh, nodding, uh, nodding his head. So, what is your perspective? What do we need from policy right now to speed up the transformation, Anders? Egilur at Stockholm XG. Yeah, I... I very much uh, <coughs> what what Osa is saying is actually crucial and important. But if you, if you look at even more realistic and what we we need now is actually to secure the whole discussion around bi biofuel. That's that's important for the Nordic country, not only for the energy sector. It's extremely important for forestry. It's extremely important for the agriculture sector. Uh, that we need to make sure. Uh, we need to understand that there are different possibilities in the Nordic countries than there are in southern Spain, for instance. Uh, we, we also need to take into account we can't utilize waste in the way we're doing in, in Europe, for instance, and that we need to have a long term perspective on. Utilizing resources otherwise lost has been a tremendous success story in the Nordic countries and is one reason why we are so CO2 free today. Uh, we need, of course, address the plastic in, in, in the waste, but that can be done, for instance, like we are doing with the sorting facility, which are connected to the waste incineration plant in, in advance. But, but then I also think that there are, uh, I would emphasize more than the long term perspective. We need also in, in the Nordic country to understand that I think that the, the energy only market might be reviewed. We need to have maybe a, a thoroughly done investigation to have a holistic view on the whole energy market to make sure that we can have affordable electricity, affordable capacity, and make sure that we are willing to invest in both electricity production, network, and the whole energy system as such. And I think that uh, is, uh, is an urgent need to start that process because it will take a couple of years. Then looking at, at, at the next step, I think it, it's urgent also actually to make sure that uh, we, we heard from, from Katarina this morning that they are spending a couple of uh, very or, or huge amount of money from the European Innovation Fund 
we have received a grant for our major flagship project, uh, BioCCS in Stockholm. But we should take a holistic view also in the Nordic countries from a political point of view, how to make sure that we utilize the extreme unique <coughs> competitiveness we have of creating carbon sink, producing hydrogen, and at the same time going into the green transition, which we we'll, we'll need. I, I think also when I, I listen to Jan Moström, we need to make sure that there are electricity in the mining industry. We need to make sure that there are hydrogen from the processes. And then we need to have a really holistic view. And I think, unfortunately, I think we need to have a holistic review of the whole energy system sets up in Sweden to make sure that we are willing to invest in it in the future. Th thank you, Anders. Let's move over to Anders in Norway from Agder Energy. Energy, you're not members of EU and... Uh, and uh, but you still are affected by it. So, uh, what is your perspective? What do you need from policy? A lot has been said here from uh, Anna Seglund and uh, Osa Pettersson, but I think from from our point of view, we definitely like the the need for speed and determination uh, on on policies in 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 order to accelerate actually the green shift, the green the green transition, and. In Norway, I also feel that we have a kind of a moral commitment for governments and companies alike. The reason for that is a lot of the renewable companies are municipality or stately owned. So you kind of you benefit of, of uh, all of, of the ownership and also on the oil and gas industry, which is also you know a lot of stately owned. Uh, a combination of effort between the renewables and the oil and gas company we definitely see now a huge investment into offshore, into uh, hydrogen, uh, and to have the, you know a determination from from the politicians to in Norway to actually be a part of that green transition will give us a lot. And just uh, just to put a couple of numbers on that, also mentioned that uh, the, the the numbers for for Sweden in the region of southern Norway where we own the grid. We have used 100 years to build the grid that we own, that is in the length of around half of the globe. The demand for grid in our region is the same as we have used 100 years to build. We have to build in the next four to five years if we should uh, keep up with the demand. Mm. So so the politicians then to, to really, you know, uh, be have high speed and determination in all the processes is is definitely important to keep up the speed. Mm. We, we got a question from the chat. Uh, I don't know if you've seen it, but uh, uh, Norway is doing fantastic things in, in the energy sector. But uh, when will you l let the oil stay, stay in the soil, if you say so? When will that happen? Uh, just a yeah, short did, response did, on that. I did, answer. I did answer it, but I can comment on it. I think... Uh, I think right now we should be actually happy, all of us, that Norway can supply so much gas to the European countries. We provide about 20% of the demand right now. But we all know that that is temporarily. It will go down and we will shut it down, down the road. But right now I think it is important. And that is also, you know, seeing who the owners mm -hmm. is behind the, the gas from Norway. Mm -hmm. I think, again, we also have a moral commitment to invest into renewables. And to put a timeline on that is, I think, is extremely difficult. But but we <laughs> fought with all the big oil and gas companies in Norway, and we partner up with yeah. some of them as well uh, in order to invest into renewables. Yeah. So it's not an easy answer, but it will <laughs> definitely be prepared down the road. No, thank you so much, Anders. So let, let's move over to Anna Karin Hatt from uh, LRF. So uh, what is your perspective? I know... There is a big need for a lot of policy uh, in your sector, and you, both from uh, looking at the energy perspective uh, that already mentioned, but also from the, the agriculture. So, what do you say? Yes, that, that's true, really true, Nina. And I won't mention them all, uh, but I would like to mention a few uh, on food and uh, energy. And, and, and if, to start with food production, uh, we have had a quite op optimistic uh, debate and, and discussion so far this morning. 
But I would say that food production in Sweden is really under stress right now. Uh, we all know that in the long run, we have the need and the possibility to increase production in a very sustainable way in Sweden. But right now, uh, Swedish farmers are really facing severe challenges uh, due to this new geopolitical context. And that's, uh, that's due to the high, high prices and, and uh, fast increasing prices on these inputs that I mentioned uh, before fertilizers fuels seed fodder everything has um, increased a lot uh, during uh, four or five months and we have seen a 20 percent cost inflation when it comes to inputs uh, needed to to produce uh, food in sweden so right now unfortunately we really need christ help from the government and from the parliament and we hope that uh, it's on its way in now during june um talking about food production i would say that that the other, it's not policy, but it is uh, quite important that uh, the market does its share. And in the long run, uh, we are of the uh, of the view that that it's it's not good for a sector to be dependent on uh, on political price pa packages uh, when it comes to to being uh, drain or or heat or or cost inflation that we are facing right now. So in the long run, we have to make sure that the market has the possibility and the capacity to, to pay the prices that farmers are needs to be paid uh, to reflect the costs that the, it, they have for producing food in a very sustainable way, as we are doing in Sweden. Some positive steps uh, from a farmer's point of view has been taken when it comes to prices, but not enough still not enough. Uh, when it comes to food and energy, uh, I would say that what Swedish farmers and forest owners really need now is clear messages from the market and from the policymakers that it is a priority to increase sustainable farming and food production and to increase renewable energy production. It's really important that, that the farmers and forest owners feel that the society wants them to produce more and uh, that's really important uh, and i would like to echo also when it comes to uh, the european level uh, we really see that uh, eu policy has to be changed it has to improve conditions for increased production of bioenergy, of renewables, of sustainable fuels. Uh, they are saying one thing in the speeches, uh, but in policy legislation is, is still not, um, not as uh, positive uh, and long-lasting as it should be in order to make these huge investments uh, happen. We have great renewable resources in the Swedish and the Nordic woods and on the fields and in waste produced from the woods and, and fields uh, that we have to, to use in a very, uh, very much better way uh, when we are trying or, or have to get rid of the, our high dependency of fossil fuels and materials and dependency on countries that we really don't want to be dependent on in the future. Th thank you so much, Anna Karin. Let's move over to the mining industry, yeah. if you say so, and to, to Jan Moström. Uh, what do you want to see from policy? What I think is the most important thing is to develop a um, transformation policy coherent with climate and environmental policy. Because if we really want to offset the climate change in, in a new geopolitical context, it's utmost important to, to develop and create a regional value chain. And that means that we have to start with a substantial increase in power production, distribution, storage. And with that as a base, uh, develop new methodologies, processes for um, green mining and also green metallurgical performance, where we need a lot of these uh, electricity and hydrogen. And with that as a um, um, base, you have to take the next step. You have to transform blast furnaces into electric or furnaces. And then you have deal with most of, of the climate impact from, from um, energy production and re reduction of these materials. And if you are going to get the uh, permit for each part of these quite uh, complex processes, this will take an incredible amount of time. So how to find a way to get access to land because all these um, operations will need access to land. 
and also access to permits. And this has to be in an uh, efficient way that we haven't seen for, for decades. So with a transformation policy as a foundation, start to work with how to, to create these regional value chains that are the foundation for what will come after. Thank you so much. So, uh, Ulva, your important sector that will finance all this, uh, what do you need for policy to speed up the transformation? Um, well, I will start to say that I don't agree that a high price on oil and gas has the same effect as a carbon tax. It's, it's not the cost that is put upon fossil fuel producers. And, and one of effect of the oil and gas prices going up is that it has a positive effect for owners and investors that have invested in oil and other fossil-based fossil energy producers. So unfortunately, this might attract more investors to increase their investments in fossil-based energy. Good point. And then going in the wrong direction. Mm. Uh, and as I mentioned, for example, we have a net zero emission target for our investments, and we will continue to work according to our plan to net zero targets at 2050 for our investments. But we have a strong financial position, so we can withstand considerable turbulence in the financial markets. But I would say it's it's worrying time right now. And here we need support from the policy, from policy to stay focused on the climate goal and to provide long time term incentives and long term conditions. And right now, oil and gas companies are making a lot of money. And I would say we need a carbon emission tax more than ever right now. Good point. And, and you are so also dependent as, as the, we, we are running out of time. So just a short comment. Uh, so important of the value chain. You have your investors and, and you invest in the value chain. And uh, if you should just say one word, uh, Ylva Vesian, uh, about the value chain perspective and the transformation. Yeah, it's important that we, we look at at the whole value chain and have a systematic approach and a holistic approach. And our investment in the steel company, SSAB, I would say is a good example for that. Uh, when we invested in SSAB, we did that to support their important transition to fossil free steel production that they are leading. At the same time, we are investing in one of Sweden's largest company that have the largest emissions it stands for 10% of all Sweden's carbon dioxide emissions. So for our own portfolio, we went at the wrong uh, path, but we have an, a, a net zero target and that is due to our, our promise to the UN convened net zero asset owner alliance. And we, we, we are committed to make a real world mm -hmm. impact to, to, to do change for mm -hmm. real. So we, all investors need to support mm. the companies that that actually do that and yeah. not only to have our own portfolios yeah. as green as possible. Yeah. I want to thank you all. This, this went too fast. <laughs> Ulva Vesen, Anders Egelrud, Åsa Pettersson, Jan Moström, Anders Gaudestad och Anna-Karin Hatt. Thank you so much for your contribution. It's been so valuable. So I hope you have a great day. So we will move on and uh, just coming... Thank you, all of you. Uh, how can we strengthen the Nordic collaboration and resilience? How can we work together to avoid a fossil lock-in lock agenda? And I would like to present uh, Anne Beate Twinereim, uh, Minister of International Development. So please, Anne Beate. Hi, Anne Beate Twinereim, Minister of International Development and also Minister for Cooperation in Norway. Great to see you. Great to see you. Thanks for, for inviting me, Nina. Very, very good. And, and uh, we have some questions for you. And I just wonder, how can we mitigate the geopolitical risks by increased Nordic cooperation? Great question. Uh, first of all, we have to recognize that the world really has become less safe. 
uh, and and uh, and uh, well, less safe and less secure for uh, a large proportion of the uh, the inhabitants. Not only here in Europe, due to due to the illegal war on on Ukraine, but for the uh, vast population global population. And as Minister of International Development, I am very concerned and I, I follow very closely also what is happening, for example, on the African continent uh, in the aftermath of what is happening in the Ukraine, because we see that um, the food security is becoming a huge problem due to uh, abruption of, of trades and and uh, uh, production um, uh, in, in difficulties with the production in Russia and Ukraine and the exports. You, you, you all know, know the story. Uh, now, what we see globally is that the, the war in Ukraine is considered slightly different if you see it from the African continent than from, from up here in the north. So that is one point. I'm worried about the global trust uh, and the way we have been able to cooperate on the multilateral uh, arena. And that is where the Nordic voice is very important, because we have a very common uh, way of looking at, you know, we have some common values in terms of being small countries in the world uh, in need of an organized global uh, 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 arena. Uh, and a functioning multilateralism. So the way that we are able to have a common Nordic voice on the global arena is really important. Uh, and I think it's becoming increased important because we share some values in terms of international rule of law, democracy, openness, transparency, human rights. And um, and at least from from uh, my job, I see that there is a huge value in Co uh, collaborating, cooperating closely, and you know we talk. The Nordic ministers talk almost every day in some respect or another. Uh, and uh, uh, one example: currently, Norway is in the Security Council of the UN. Of course, it has been a very uh, challenging but important position now due to the war. Uh, but um, we have sort of a, 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 a deal in the Nordic countries where we help each other on a rotating basis uh, to to get that position in the Security Council. So the Swedish helped the Nordic, the, the Norwegians when we were when it was our turn, and and now we are helping the Danes. So we 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 really have a close cooperation. So maybe on the normative side, I think the Nordic voice is very very important. Thank you for the international outreach and that what we can see what's happening globally as well. So how can we accelerate climate transformation through increased Nordic cooperation? Well, uh, I'd like to start with, uh, we, we have um, really, um, we have some, some great ambitions in the Nordic countries. Um, Norway is currently chairing uh, the, we have the chairmanship in the Nordic Ministerial Council. And uh, the vision in the Nordic cooperation is that by 2030, we are to become the most sustainable and the most integrated uh, region in the world. Now, that's a huge ambition. But to be frank, I think it's absolutely within reach. Uh, and I feel that there is a big push both uh, politically in the Nordics now but also from private sector in order to collaborate more closely on, on, on pushing the green solutions. And I mentioned, um, I mentioned uh, our common values, you know, the, 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 the values and norms that we share in the Nordic countries. Uh, I believe that if we are to achieve a true green transformation, the transformation must be inclusive and fair. And, you know, in, in the Nordic countries, we have a, a, a tradition of well, inclusive and universal uh, welfare systems. And we can use our Nordic model to build the green transition in a way that includes everyone. And I think that's the only way to go ahead, because if people are left out, if people, you know, ordinary people feel that they are losing 
uh, through the green transition. They are less less money in their pockets, losing their jobs. Then we are bound to fail. So, so I, I you know, the, the the intake that we have from the Nordic is really really important. And uh, obviously, we have some technologies that the world needs. Uh, from the Norwegian side, you know, we, we try to push the hydrogen, the offshore winds, CCS battery, uh, forest industry, green shipping. Um, and I believe that there are some low hanging fruits if we are able to collaborate more closely on our natural res on, 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 uh, on, on, on how we process our natural natural resources and uh, also uh, get that technology out to the world. And again, as Minister of International Development, that's something I work with every day. I see that there is a huge need, uh, in, especially in less developed countries, for the technologies that we have on renewable energies. But we can achieve more if we collaborate within the Nordic countries. So, so having this geopolitical crisis right now, how can business think, how can business climate transformation be strengthened by increased Nordic cooperation? Well, uh, you know, politics and business need to complement each other. I mentioned some of the opportunities just now. Uh, we agree that there are many of them. Uh, and we also, um, uh, we also know, well, you know, the pandemic showed us uh, how important Nordic cooperation is, uh, and that if the mobility across the borders is distracted, uh, we lose out, both economically and, and, and socially. And so I think we have learned the hard way that we need to strengthen the mobility and the cross-border collaboration, also on the green transformation. And I think that the study that the Haga Initiative um, uh, uh, produced was was really interesting um, because it also put the finger on what businesses need from politics and it's really important that we learn from you how we can improve the Nordic co collaboration um, you know we have uh, processes going on in terms of um, uh, well, in, in Norwegian, it's called Grense Hinderode. It's it's actually a collaboration uh, with participants from all Nordic countries, looking at concrete initiatives on how to uh, facilitate the mobility. It might be in terms of IT, you know, uh, digital communication, uh, in terms of tax rules, uh, physical infrastructure, and um, we need. Uh, your advice on concrete uh, initiatives that can increase mobility across across borders and 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 um, making sure that we join uh, join efforts because I truly believe that the Nordic region can become the most sustainable region and the most integrated region uh, by 2030. We have that potential, but. There are some low-hanging fruits that we need to um, to harvest in order to get there. Thank you so much, uh, Anne Biotte, for for joining us and for giving your perspectives on this. Thank you so much. Thank you. So, good morning. So, good morning. And you are a professor in Russian environmental. Oh. Good morning. Not good morning. It's uh, in the morning. It's uh, almost noon. So Jakob Dalunda, member of European Parliament, I'm glad to see you. Hello. Hello. Good to be with you. Great. We had a fantastic morning. We had had researchers here and we had uh, business and we've been talking about uh, um, they've been saying it's so important to speed up the transformation. When we talked about possibilities, uh, most of them said there is a possibility right now uh, because of the geopolitical crisis. We can see we can see we have possibilities, but there is also a big need for cooperation. So you are our last speaker today, and uh, and I will you will help me to summarize this uh, with my questions to you. So. Um, being in the member, uh, being in the parliament, uh, and your perspective from there is very important for us. So, how, we start out with, how can we mitigate the geopolitical risks and at the same time strengthen climate transformation 
by Nordic cooperation or in someone else, in someone other way of doing it? I would like to stress that right now we are actually slowing down the transition. Uh, just last week in the European Parliament, we had a vote on the next step in reforming the European emissions uh, trading system that puts a price on the emissions of the energy sector and the, and the um, energy sector and the industry sector. And it was very close that we took a vote that would actually scale down ambition below what the Commission proposed. And the reasoning for this is that um, the, 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 those parts who want to slow down the transition say that it's because of the industry, that the industry cannot cope with the stress that the current uh, economic, economic situation puts on them, uh, given the, the war in, in Ukraine, and, and therefore uh, we are looking to slow down the transition. And the same thing is happening in very many member states, where governments all across Europe are putting in various forms of subsidies or reducing carbon taxes, uh, slowing down the transition. And, and it's really imperative that we get uh, help I heard in the discussion that there's, we are talking about what businesses need from politics, but but truly it also goes the other way around. <laughs> we need help. We need help in, in telling another version of the actual reality. Uh, actually, increasing climate ambition will reduce our dependency on Russia and will actually make the war in Ukraine stop earlier. And increasing climate ambition will increase our independence on on fossil fuels mm. and and uh, and and um, support mm. a, a more prosperous mm. europe creating more more jobs but we are uh, day by day actually losing uh, that uh, battle so i am i'm very worried uh, from that point of view in uh, earlier today we had an interview with vela pekki tinkinen who is the professor in russian environmental studies and he said the decision last week is playing in Putin's hands. That's exactly what he wants to happen. Uh, careful decisions, not, not taking the right decisions, is exactly what Russia wants. So, so and, and you were saying the same thing, because we have heard of the possibilities that is really a lot of things happening right now, but at the same time, we need to speed up uh, with policy. And you also said that business uh, need to, to say that uh, they need to see this climate transformation. And I, I would say that's what we've been hearing today and also from, from the business network arrangements is we are saying that all the time, that we can succeed with the climate transformation if we get the right policy. But the dance we're talking about between policy and business, I think that is that is so important. Uh, I just want to one one discussion we had this morning was about uh, biofuels and how can you, we have these Nordic perspectives on biofuels that is not going hand in hand with the southern Europe. What is your perspective? How can the Nordics contribute with biofuels in repower EU? Well. Generally speaking, uh, European legislation uh, uh, regulates the sort of demand side of biofuels, while normally it is national legislation that governs the production side of, of biofuels, which means that in most member states, uh, European legislation that incentivizes consumption of biofuels don't necessarily mean increased production of sustainable biofuels in those member states, but very likely means uh, the uh, import of unsustainable uh, biofuels from other parts of the world. Um, that, that's why what, what we... I, I think it's very narrow-minded if we only focus about the European demand side. Uh, if, if we want to unlock uh, the incentives for sustainable consumption, of biofuels, we also need to do the homework in very many member states to ensure the production of sustainable biofuels. Uh, because otherwise, uh, it will be very difficult for me as a Scandinavian member of the European Parliament to convince my progressive colleagues in, other, in, the, in the Parliament of, of, the, of the merits of sustainable biofuels, because from their perspective, that very concept is greenwashing. Mm. Uh, so we, we have a, a, a lot of work to do, mm. and that's not, not only PR work, it's no. also policy work in mm. many member states to ensure uh, the sustainable production of, of biofuels. Mm. 
what an important perspective. Thank you for that. And uh, looking at, uh, just look, go down to the, the Swedish context with uh, how important is the reduction quota scheme, reduktionsplikten, uh, for the climate transformation and to reduce the uh, dependence of Russian oil? I would say it, ex it is extremely important. And and the what the, the current Swedish government is doing, uh, breaking or putting a pause on on the scaling up the, of the uh, reduction scheme, I think it's it's very detrimental. And I think we are, are just putting ourselves uh, in, in the corner, both in terms of making the uh, green transition more expensive, mm. uh, because the, the less that we do on the... Uh, how to say uh, consumption part of of the uh, of the fossil fuels the more we need to do in other measures which is uh, likely more more expensive so uh, the best thing that we the problem is that we're looking too much the politics is looking too much on the symptoms mm -hmm. and too little on on the problems mm -hmm. uh, in the way that we are reducing carbon taxes reducing the reducing the reduction uh, scheme because of very many voters might feel the sort of short term pain mm -hmm. but uh, the more that we do that the more we are creating problems for ourselves mm -hmm. in the future and the more we are uh, putting money in in Putin's pockets, which will only need uh, it will require us to spend even more on defense. Mm. So, in very many ways, um, this policy is, is quite expensive. Mm. Uh, we, we need to spend more on defense uh, spending, and we will need to spend more money on adaptation to climate change mm. in the future. And and we are standing here and have a lot of crisis in front of us. We have the climate crisis. We talked about the food crisis before in one of the panels. We have the Ukraine. Uh, how do we handle all the crises that we stand? How can we succeed with climate transformation with all this crisis? I think that's really a, a big problem given that uh, the way that our public sphere is functioning, it seems that, that we can only handle one crisis at a time. Um, just last week uh, in the European Parliament, we had a vote on, on ETS, which was reported that the proposal from the Environmental Committee was shut down. But in the very same vote, we actually voted on a quite uh, ambitious reform of the way that aviation pays in the ETS, which is really ambitious, but, re which is really ambitious, but nobody wrote about that uh, because the amount of journalists that cover what we do is very limited and they cannot afford to spend too much time actually understanding what we're voting on mm. and how that how that works mm. so so if we want to scale up the the the, uh, the green transition that's not only about what we do politically it's also how how the media functions and mm. we need to make sure that we pay for mm. quality journalism mm. that can accurately cover what is actually going on mm. in, in, in our politics, mm. in our societies. Finally, is it anything in this geopolitical crisis and all this crisis that we have that makes you positive? Well, there are some good things happening, like, like the uh, vote that we had last week on uh, banning um, internal combustion engine cars, mm -hmm. uh, sending a clear signal to the market mm -hmm. that it's electric cars mm -hmm. uh, going forward. We had a very good vote on, on aviation, uh, making sure that we are putting a much stronger carbon price on the emissions of aviation. Mm -hmm. So a lot of good things are, mm -hmm. are happening, but, um, but at the same time, uh, the political pressure on the green transition is mm. is is weakening, and um, and we need ma we need to make sure that uh, that when voters um, pick their party, that they not only that they also taking the uh, the, the green transition in, mm. into account. Mm. Thank you so much, Jakob de Lunde, that you could uh, end this uh, webinar together with us, and uh, I hope you have a great day. Thank you so much, Jakob. You too. Thank and I also, I also want to thank you all that have been listening to this webinar. Thank you so much. And also I want to thank you all the speakers for a fantastic contribution. And uh, I just want to wish you a great day today. Thank you and goodbye.